Amen. Well, it's good to have you folks. If you have your Bible, turn to Song of Solomon with me tonight, chapter 1. Three books of the Bible are attributed to Solomon, king of Israel, son of David. One of them is uh, Proverbs, many of the Proverbs, when he had his wisdom. And then the Song of Solomon, uh, when he was in love with the Lord Jesus. And then the uh, last one's the book of Ecclesiastes, a broken man full of vain, full of vanity, saying that all the world is vanity. Song of Solomon, chapter number one. How many's ever heard of John Phillips? Some of you have, John Phillips. I've got a lot of his materials available. John Phillips has a little different take on the Song of Solomon. It's one of those things that when you read it, it'll cause you to do a little thinking. John Phillips says that the uh, the beloved is not Solomon. He says that the beloved is actually the love of the Shulamite and that Solomon is trying to break in and separate her from her love, uh, which of course is here. Now, I'm not saying I subscribe to that, but it's interesting to read because I want you to notice what happens here in chapter number one, verse one. The song of songs, which is Solomon's, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. Now note carefully verses 5 through 8. I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. Father, bless this word now. In your name I pray, amen. There's, go ahead and be seated. Now I'm going to tell you something about the Song of Solomon. There's two things about it right off the bat before we go any further. And that is the Song of Solomon is about communion. It's not about salvation, it's about communion. And it's probably the highest record that you'll find in a spiritual sense of communion in all the Bible to show you how very, very important communion is. And then there's a word that does not show up in the Song of Solomon that's all over the Bible. I mean everywhere in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But this word does not show up in the Song of Solomon. Have I got you thinking? It's a little word. It's got three letters doesn't show up in the Song of Solomon. S-I-N. The word sin does not show up in the Song of Solomon. Now, if you'll remember in 1 John chapter number 1, this is the fellowship we have with the Father and His Son. And it says plainly that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the verse before that says that if we say we have not sinned, then we deceive ourselves. The last verse says, if we say we have no sin, we call God a liar. So what's going on in the first uh, chapter of the Song of Solomon is the spiritual on a high level as it deals with sin before it ever is practiced or it ever does come to physical fruition. Sin originates in the heart and it shows you how to deal with that because this is how God deals with his children. He wants to commune with you. He knows you're not perfect. You never will be perfect in this life. And if you strive for perfection and think you've ever reached there, what you've become is a self-righteous Pharisee. Period. I want to be nice about it, but that's exactly what you are if you think you're sinless. But you see, the Lord doesn't mock you with it. He doesn't beat you over the head with it. He wants fellowship with you. So the second thing I talked about from 1 John was the idea of praying. We went to Colossians chapter number 3. And verse number three, where it says plainly, when you're talking about praying, you're talking about communion with God, it says your life is hid with Christ in God. 
Remember that? Your life is hid with Christ in God. In plain words, Satan cannot see and hear everything. God has hidden certain things from Satan. And if you don't tell him as you pray what you're saying, uh, he won't be able to know what you're saying. And we went to Romans chapter number 8 where it says we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, these groanings are on a high level with God talking to God on behalf of one of his children. I'm say that again. With God talking to God on behalf of one of his children. You mean the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is God. The Holy Ghost is God, folks. And he's speaking to the Father on behalf of his children. In other words, he's making intercession for us according to the will of God. And so 1 John starts out with sin that is on a high spiritual level. And if communion takes care of it, then it doesn't need, in chapter number 2, an advocate. You don't need an advocate because it's settled in a spiritual level with God. But if the advocate, but if you don't, it starts on a high spiritual level in 1 John, winds up with a sin unto death. See? Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, what you get from the Song of Solomon is the relationship that a believer has with our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me say this for you tonight. This is all important. I know you've heard it, but you need to hear it again. There is only one thing that keeps me going in this world. There's only one place that I can find sustenance for my soul. There's only one way that I can find life, and that's not through the church, and it's not through people, it's not through the ministry, it's not through accomplishments, it's not through ability, it's through Christ. And I have to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit of God to make Christ and for him to become what I need in this life. Everything, for the Apostle Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now look carefully, for to me to live. In plainer words, Paul's idea of life is Christ. And Christ, who is our life, who is our life, when he appears, we shall appear with him in glory. But it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now this is what brings us into the Song of Solomon. Here's some things that are important about it. Note carefully that she says of herself that she's black and comely. And this black she's referring to are the uh, goat's hair's tents. Uh, yes, that's right. Goat's hair, they made tents like that. If you remember, who in the New Testament was an apostle that was a tent maker? Anybody remember that? Exactly. Saul of Tarsus, a tent maker. A Roman citizen educated the feet of Gamaliel. He was a tent maker. And so therefore we have a connection going on here with tents. You see, he, she says that I am black and comely. But now here's what it says in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 1, and verses 9 through 10. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. You see, the Solomon, if it's Solomon, is saying, well, you may call yourself black and you may say that you are comely, but that's not what I see. He says, I see something entirely different than that. He says, I see beauty that is not measured by man's beauty. I see beauty that rises far above that. You see, folks, he wants fellowship with us. Now listen to what it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 61 and verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. See that? As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. What could connect them any closer than that? He said, you see yourself one way, but I see you in a different way. The Bible says love covereth a multitude of sins. Yes, sir. God wants fellowship with you, and he wants it, and he wants communion with you. He wants you to commune with him. How many has ever heard of the word community? You hear it all the time. We live in such and such community. Do you know, do you know the root of that word? We live in an era where people commune with each other. That's what community means. Of course, they don't. Most people around Knoxville doesn't even know who their next door neighbor is. <laughs> but you see, this is 2024. Things have changed a lot. But notice what it says in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, 
that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's talking about what he's doing for you in this life right now. He's preparing you for the great wedding day. Now, unlike the groom who doesn't see his bride, our Lord Jesus Christ knows his bride and has hidden his bride in himself and is purifying her and cleansing her for that day when the wedding takes place. Now, there's something about it that, that needs to be understood. The Bible says you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Do you have a new life when you were born again? Did you get a new life? Of course you did. Of course you did. Does an unsaved man have any idea what that life is? He has no idea. He has no idea. He has nothing to relate with because he's not born again. He's dead spiritually in the sight of God. The Bible talks about us being hidden in the cleft of the rock. You see, he hides that which belongs to him so the enemy cannot take it. He said, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Neither can Satan hear what you're praying from your soul, nor can he see your life that is hid with Christ in God. Amen. His children, you're dead and your life is hid. Now you know it's quite remarkable. The Song of Solomon chapter number two says, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. Now, once again, to remind you, Beloved is referring to Solomon or the one I mentioned before, and my love is referring to the Shulamite. This is the way you can differentiate between the two. My love, loved one, is the Shulamite. Beloved is Solomon. Now, you know the Bible says in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 7 and verse number 8, look at this about the apple. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 8. I said I will go up to the palm tree, I will take hold of the boughs thereof. Now also thy breast shall be as clusters of the vine, and thy smell and the smell of thy nose like apples. The fruit is brought into this thing, and it's a pleasant perfume. This is fellowship. Have you ever seen something that turns your stomach? Have you witnessed something that you used to do in the old life, and it literally turns your stomach now? Well, that's a stench. You see, it stinks in the nostrils of God and in the nostrils of a believer. In Song of Solomon, chapter number 2 and verse number 3, look at this. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. See this? She delights in the shade the burning sun can no longer, she has been in the sun, she talks about in chapter one. But once you come into the shadow of his wings, under his protection, you can't be burned, you can't be taken, you can't be afflicted because you belong to him. And this is what she's saying. Look at chapter number two and verse number three again. As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with a great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. What's the fruit he, she's talking about? Well, the Bible says that if you have the Holy Ghost, there's fruit there, right? The fruit of the Spirit is such and such and such and such. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit, because if you have the Holy Spirit, every fruit that can be produced by the Holy Spirit is in you already. You following that? Every single fruit. This is why Christians don't major on certain doctrines or certain things. Watch out for that one. Watch out for that one. Because when God saved you, he saved you completely. And when he gave you the Holy Spirit, there's only one Holy Spirit. And that means the potential is in you tonight. If the Holy Ghost dwells within you, all the power, he said, many things I've done, but greater things you'll do because I go to my father. He goes to his father and his father sends the Holy Spirit. Literally, the Holy Spirit becomes an apostle to this generation. That's what the word apostle means, a sent one. The Greek word is apostello. So he is sent because of the power of the resurrected Christ, the unction and the anointing that is given to the Holy Spirit that he did not have before. 
He could come upon David and leave David. David said, take not thine Holy Spirit from me, but not now. So the apostle Paul says, stir up the gift that is in you by the laying on of hands by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Do you have the Holy Ghost? As the old timers used to say, does the Holy Ghost have you? <laughs> Which probably would be a better analogy of it. So yes, sweet and luscious is the fruit. Oh, what a difference there is between dead works, which you see all the time in the church house, and the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 25 and verse 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Oh, soul. Did you know the Bible says that a fool is known by a multitude of words? Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, you can't get a word in edgewise. It's hard to listen when you're talking. Sometimes you should uh, clam it up, zip it up, and listen. You might be surprised at what somebody has to say that'd be helpful. Oh, yeah. Now, the scripture talks about a tree of life in the Song of Solomon. A tree of life. You remember the Lord Jesus was crucified? The Bible says he was hung upon a tree. The scripture says, cursed is everyone that hangs upon a tree. If you remember in the Old Testament, there was a long golden haired son of David who got his locks caught in a tree, in an oak tree. Who was that? Abba Shalom, Abba, Abba, Father Shalom of peace. Absalom stood at the gate, turned against his father and raised his own army and his own following. He becomes a type of the Antichrist when he did that. Abba Shalom. But how did he die? He died because his glory. They pulled his hair once a year. His glory got caught in a place that was too holy for him. Too holy. You see, the tree grows up out of the ground. It touches the dirt, but it rises into the heavens. The Lord said, as they, as they lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, he said, I'll draw all men unto me. I'm afraid today that we lift preachers up too much. We lift up the ministry too much. We brag about our buildings too much. We need to be preaching Christ and preach Christ and Him crucified. If God ever burned anything into my soul, it's that. And I've always believed that, but it's a place now where it's literally changed me. That's all I think about all day long. I don't think about sin. I think about Christ. I love Him. I've dedicated and consecrated my life to Him. I don't know how many more beats are in this heart. I don't know how many more times these lungs will draw a breath. I don't know how long my spirit will reside in this body, but I, by the grace of God, it'll be for Christ. It'll be for him, given to him. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number three and verse 18, she's a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is ever one that retaineth her. Her, personification of who? Who's her? What does God lay great story in, in the book of Proverbs? What word? W-I-S, what is it? Wisdom, that's right. We got the churches are full of knowledge, heads puffed up with knowledge, you know, puffed up, but no wisdom. You need to know, but you need wisdom, wisdom. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. A tree of life, hope deferred, maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Words fitly spoken that I'm trying to give to you tonight to show you how our Lord Jesus Christ is that tree of life. How that cross that he was crucified on, look to that cross and you'll live. As Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, all he had to do was look. They didn't have to touch it. They didn't have to touch it or even talk about it. Just look. I mean, what could be simpler than that? And regardless of your condition, foaming at the mouth maybe from one of these vipers, all you had to do was look and you would be healed immediately. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Your words speak forth from the heart. Do you want to know what kind of heart a man has? Listen to his tongue. You don't judge a tree, my dear friend, from the uh, boasting and bragging and what it says it can do. You judge a tree by the fruit it bears. That's right. The fruit it bears. He's called the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. The rose of Sharon, they tell us, was white. It's a variety of a Damascene rose. 
the lily of the valley is wild crimson. We got white and we got red. Now that white surely would represent our Lord's righteousness, his holiness. But what would the red represent? Surely you know what that is. What color is that blood? You know the folks that never got outside and didn't get a tan, working in the fields. They were the people, the elite, and they stayed in the buildings. And so their skin was real white. But you could see the blood. You could see the blood through the skin. And what color was it as you saw it through the skin? Blue. That's where the term blue blood came from. That's right. Blue blood. The ones who were the elite who didn't work in the fields. When Paul Pot went into Cambodia, and I remember when he did it, he went into Cambodia, and you know what he did? You know what he did? He went through there and he shook the hands of the Cambodian people. And all the hands that had, had uh, you know, had, had scar tissue and rough, they were field workers. They were laborers with the hands. But the ones who had soft hands, he put them to death because they were the educated intelligentsia. He didn't want any, he didn't want any opposition. And so they called it the killing fields. Look it up. Get online. Look it up. Pol Pot, Cambodia. Back in the time of Vietnam when our troops were down there. And so we have white and we have red. The Song of Solomon, though, is a beautiful thing because note carefully what it says in chapter 4, verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south, blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. What's she doing? She's saying, I know what's in here. I know what you gave me when you saved me. You know that tonight. But how does it come out? How do you minister that? How do you minister what's in your heart and in your soul? You do it by the Holy Spirit of God. That's how you do it. It has to be done by the Holy Ghost. So you have to learn what it is to not grieve him and to not quench him. And pride is the worst thing that can happen to a Christian. Pride. He resists it. But he gives grace to the humble. The Holy Spirit moving through a believer is a powerful thing. A very powerful thing. And she says, let it blow, O north wind. Where does promotion come from? North. That's exactly right. So the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, gets into evangelism. And I want you to notice what goes on here because this is important tonight. Chapter 5, verse 9. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than any another beloved, that thou dost so charge us? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. Note the question, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? Are you absolutely certain tonight that your Lord Jesus Christ is infinitely above every God there is on this earth? Are you absolutely fully convinced that he has no equal? That he is alone, he is of himself? That there's, another, that there's not another like him except the ones that he makes like him when he renews your image in him? Of course, there, there's no other. I don't need to go to Buddha. I don't need to go to Confucius. I don't need to go to Mohammed. I don't need to go anywhere to get their wisdom. I've got the book of wisdom right here. And this is the tree of life. The knowledge of, of life is right here. I don't need that. This is the book. And so I say to these people, when they say, well, what is your beloved more? Than another beloved. And you know what she says? She describes him. O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? And then she answers, My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold, his locks are bushy, black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk. And fitly set, his cheeks are as the bed of spices, as sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with a barrel, his bell is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires, his legs are as pillars of marble, set upon sockets of fine gold, his countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars, his mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. 
Now look how they respond to that. Chapter 6 and verse 1. She has very, very well described him. She has let them know what he is like. Here's their response. Chapter 6, verse 1. Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside? Now get this. That we may seek him with thee. See that? See that? Do you have anything that they want out there? Is there enough of Christ in you where it might cause them to have a desire to have what you have? Think about it tonight. They're not, listen, people aren't going to come to Temple Baptist Church because I'm beautiful. <laughs> because I'm the most wonderful thing in the world. Why, good night, people. Somebody told me one time, said, you look like something fell out of the back of a hearse. I thought, man, that's a terrible <laughs> thing to say to somebody. I had a missionary told me about 45 years ago, he said, if I had another face, I'd wear it. Now, here's the bottom line. If, if all that your church is built upon is the great personality of so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, you're dead in the water. You're dead in the water. It ought to be Christ. I f still believe that he has drawing power and that they may not even know it, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the answer for every problem and salvation on this earth. There is none other. So it's our job to present Christ to them in every possible way we can. And here's what they said. We want to seek him with thee. And then my beloved has gone down to his garden to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. I belong to him and he belongs to me. Isn't that something? Reciprocal ownership. I belong to him. He belongs to me. Well, what if we take him away? You can't take him away from me. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't waste your time. He's mine. And you can't take me away from him. Because he said he sealed me in his hand. And nobody can pluck me from his hand. Amen. So I belong to him and he belongs to me. Glory to God tonight. Am I telling you about the Lord Jesus? Are you catching on to what I'm saying? Hey, and it's not how great Preacher Lawson is. I may be gone in a month or two or a week or in an hour. Who knows? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And there is none greater. Now, she had seasons of communion. In other words, times of communion, of sweet fellowship with the Lord. But there are a couple of times in here where that communion seems to be broken. Well, that's life. That's the real world. There's nobody going to live on the top of the mountain and sweet fellowship and communion with the Lord all the time. There's going to be things try your faith. There's going to be things that smack you down. There's going to be things that, uh, that stop you in your tracks. And, uh, but what do you do, preacher? Well, just go back to the one who hasn't left you. He'll never leave you. He'll be there where you're trapped, tra where your tracks stop. He'll be there where you're slapped down. He'll be there when, it, when all hell comes against you. He'll be there with you. He lets it happen. Boy, he has a greater purpose. I wish sometimes he'd let me know what it is, but he knows if I don't know. And uh, I just leave it to him. She said in Song of Solomon 5, verse 2, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew. My locks with the drops of the night. She, he's seeking her, but he won't kick the door open. She has to open it for him. There's a protocol with God, and he never deviates from that protocol. In the book of Revelation, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You remember that one, don't you? I stand and knock. I'm knocking. If you'll open that door, I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. My Father will come in. My goodness, you talk about a meal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. What a meal. Can you imagine the working and the power of the Godhead? One day we'll see that. Right now we experience it, all of that. You're experiencing it, but you don't see it like you will be able to see it in that day. 
Song of Solomon 5.8, I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. Now, let me say that another way. I'm love sick. She's not saying I'm sick and tired of love itself. No, she's saying I am sick because I am in love. Amen. Isn't that something? When was the last time you found somebody who latched on to real love and it literally just made them sick? I mean, they couldn't function. All they could do was think about the one they loved. Ball, awake, O north wind, come. Awake and come. You know, he says in here, give me to drink. He wants something to drink. There's something about drinking. Give me to drink. Song of Solomon 4.15. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Lebanon is the high place, goes down to the Dead Sea, which is the low place. From Lebanon to the Dead Sea, there's quite a message. There's quite a revelation of Scripture. From Lebanon in the north, cedars of Lebanon. I've seen Lebanon. I've seen the snow-capped mountain in June and July when we went to the Holy Land. There's Lebanon. And it goes down, descends into the Dead Sea. The word Jordan means descender. It's going down. So what he's saying is, he says, uh, he says uh, this Lebanon, he said, give me the drink. Streams from Lebanon, fountains of gardens, wells of living waters. You know, it's remarkable how that these statements line up with the Gospel of John. John, chapter number 4, verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. In other words, you don't need Christ and need to get him later. You got him, you got him. He'll never leave you. You don't need, you don't need to, if, if you've been born of the Holy Spirit, born of God. You don't need somebody to lay hands on you later on. Pray for, pray for the Holy Ghost to come back and for Christ to come back. No, sir, he never left. What you do is stir up that gift that is in you. But the Bible said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This is the soul's thirst quenched at the fountain. If you're not quenched tonight, you've been drinking from the wrong fountain. Religion is man's substitute for communion with Christ. It is. It's man's substitute. Now, it can be pretty. It can be nice. It can be well organized. Good night. I mean, men are capable of a lot of things. Bottom line is, though, that's no communion in it. No communion. And you have to constantly be changing it to feed the flesh. Because the flesh is never satisfied. I'm going to say that again now. The flesh is never satisfied satisfied oh for a while because it's novel some new thing um, you know you might play with it but it'll still go back to the same thing you'll never be satisfied but you will with Christ I've never gotten tired of him never have no 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 he's beautiful tonight he's my savior tonight he's the lover of my soul he introduced me to the Godhead in a way that no one else could have. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Now chapter 4 verse 14. Read it again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water. Springing up into everlasting life. The supply. The Holy Spirit. The supply of your life. He doesn't leave you in a waste howling desert. That's where he found you. But he doesn't leave you there. Every provision that you need for this life will come from the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit of God. From God the Father. And then John 7 verse 38. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's what we need to be doing now for a lost and dying world. For people who don't know the Lord, they don't know what we're talking about here tonight. Do you know what the streams in the desert are? Do you know what the waters from Lebanon are? Do you know what the waters that are coming from the garden? Water in the Bible is a refreshing, sustaining, life-sustaining thing. You can go much longer without food than you can water. You sure can. You can go much longer without food than you can without water. You have to have it. And we have to have the Holy Ghost. We've got to have the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have to have 
the Holy Spirit of God. Wisdom folks tonight would say this, Lord, teach me, show me in my life what I'm doing. If I'm doing something to grieve the Holy Spirit, show me. Make it clear to me. Show me. Now, if I'm doing something about the, my life, well, ever on my mouth when it's running, that I'm quenching the Holy Spirit, let me know. Let me know. And there's nothing greater than that. Because without the Holy Spirit, there's no communion. None. And without communion, you're dead in the water. And it's not the preacher's fault, you're miserable. And it's not your wife's fault, and it's not your husband's fault, it's not your children's fault. It's not the boss's fault. Well, why am I miserable? Listen, you can have the worst boss. Being married, you could be married to a bossy wife. <laughs> you can go to a dead church, twice dead and plucked up by the roots. But if you are in communion with God, you can rejoice and have joy in your soul in the midst of a dead place like that. You can. And you know something? I've noticed about this. I've noticed that when a person has that joy, the real joy of the Holy Spirit, it's contagious. Somebody will catch it. They'll catch it. And it'll begin to spread. And the first thing you know, you got people thinking about Christ instead of, instead of themselves. That's what we need in here. We do. We need that desperately to move into the future. We need the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Not by power nor by might, but by my what? And that's in the book of Zechariah when Satan stood at the right hand of Joshua the priest to, to resist him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Bless these dear folk, the little time we've had together. I pray I've said something, Father, tonight from Song of Solomon in this one area that I've picked. Oh, Lord, there's so much more, so much more in the Song of Solomon, but I just went through this part with them, and you know that. But I pray that it helped them I pray that it reinvigorated them, that it re restored, built, back a fire, built a fire back, gave them a desire, Lord, to seek you and to come to you. In your name I pray, amen. All right. That's all I've got. I'm done. <laughs>